Good day, this is Brad Kayla, PhD. And my PhD stands for Post Hole Digger. That means that I continue to work on the proper foundation for the prodigal son and daughter. Today we're talking about something that doesn't mean a lot for some of you, but my Sambal Ulek sandwich after a relentless lack of remorse. A crossroad of conviction versus opinion. Was Jesus a Christian? Let's check out and see what you think. Was Jesus a Christian? And are you smarter than a fifth grader? Good day, this is Brad Kayla, PhD. And my PhD stands for Post Hole Digger. That means simply that I continue to work on a proper foundation for the prodigal son and daughter. Today, I'd like to share something that happened to me 57 years ago. My Sambal Ulek sandwich after a relentless lack of remorse. You see, as a kid, my mom died when I was six years old. And so having spent seven years in an orphanage with my brothers and sisters, when my father remarried, it was a big deal. I did not fit in the family and it showed. And so from time to time I got punished the old fashioned way. My dad had gone through the war, my mom, stepmother at that time, she had gone through the war in Indonesia, Japanese prison camp. So all they knew was the hard way. And one way of punishing me for little discretions was if I had sipped on a bottle of juice, I had to empty three bottles just to teach me not to do that. When I took a little piece of a pie, because he loved baking, or my grandmother used to, uh, I had to eat a whole pie. And this time, I had to eat a sandwich with sambal ulek. Now, for those that don't know what sambal is, sambal is a hot, spicy red pepper. Now, a uh, sambal ulek sandwich, I'll give you some examples of them. They are delicious, but as a kid, I had to eat it as punishment. Now that I'm 70 this morning, I woke up and started my regular routine. And I noticed my pot of sambal was just about empty. So I emptied the whole thing, made sure I scraped all the little pieces out of it and put it on the sandwich. It was hotter than hot and I loved it. And that is the reason why we talk today at Sambal Ulek Sandwich after a relentless lack of remorse. Let's find out what is the crossroad of conviction versus opinion? Is there a crossroad? Was Jesus a Christian? This is restorative justice, number 35. And the Lord called unto Moses out of the mountain, saying, Come unto me, for I would give thee the law for thy people, which shall be a covenant for the children of light. Wow, that's a mouthful. Do you know when this occurred? This was during the time that Moses came out of the desert with a whole bunch of people, millions of people, and they used to live in Egypt. And God wanted to complete something that he started in paradise. But unfortunately, our friend Moses was not able to get the Jewish people or the people that were with him, that later on became the Jews, that they were not ready to sign the covenants as the children of light. Now, where did I get this story from? The Dead Sea Scrolls and Reflection. In the final months of 2020, can we reflect on all we have learned about ourselves this year? Taking together the journey to self-acceptance begins with reflection. Reflection is something you do when you have finished a year or a period of time. This act is a state of understanding and recognizing one's ability and limitations. Did you discover the quality of your personality, uh, particularly helpful in coping with the uncertainties this year? What new hobbies or skills did you develop? I'm talking about the year of the pandemic. 
change in who you are as a person is out of the ordinary. Many people find it hard when they're writing to rewrite something because they keep on going and falling into the same procedure. We are not just talking about preferences of, or opinions. You see, the challenge is when you change your mind, at least we can hope for is a friendship by which we can disagree. So many people have a hard time when they have something in their mind that's set and they have a discussion or a dispute with somebody. During a disagreement, it will come out. And the idea is to make us think and understand why we are in the pandemic situation in December of 2020. Do I have a solution? I can share with you how I had to learn the hard way dealing with situations that what not, were not fun. So let's check it out and see if this is going to help you. One of the issues that we have in life is, is our culture important and how does it affect us? What kind of culture do we live in? And where the United States president acts like a madman, tearing down whatever is possible and wise men and women standing by on the side in support without the guts to step up to the debate. How do those onlookers or enablers, how are they relevant? And why am I bringing this back to the body of Christ? You see, the body of Christ is in total support, or I might not say total support, but a majority of the people in the United States claim that they are from Christian orientation. In other words, their foundation, their belief, their, their way of thinking is based on something that has something to do with the Bible, whether they call themselves A, B, or C. I'm not going to debate who the different types are, because I don't know. But I do know, studying the uh, magazines and stu studying also the reports of the United States that are are about 203 million people Christian and there are 320 million Americans or people that live in the United States. So factors that link them are those most of the time culture, predictably Christian in the United States. And as I mentioned already, 200 million people out of 320 acknowledge Christian based convictions. Social patterns, belief systems, values and ways of living are our society's byproduct. Is culture influential? Paraphrasing Andrew Moreau, culture is the sum of all forms of art, of love and thought, which in centuries enabled men to be less imprisoned. Whoa, that sounds heavy duty. Did you follow what I was saying? Culture is the sum of all forms of art, of love and thought, which in centuries enabled men to be less imprisoned. Are you living in a prison? And when I ask that question, are you living in a prison? Are you living in a self-made prison? Because quite often people claim they live or they imprisoned. But I share with you that I spent a considerable amount of time in front of a judge with lawyers in the beginning, 18 years and 12 years without lawyers, working a self-defense and then ending up being sentenced for six years because I dare to say no to my best friend who happens to be the head of the Freemasons. A financial transaction I did not feel comfortable with, I denied him and therefore he would show me how much power he had and by bankrupting us, he shared what he was able to do. And that really got me to think about a lot of things. What is the culture? Is it an invis invisible bond that ties us together? What is it actually that refers and makes us do certain things? Art, literature, language and religion in the community present as culture. Our culture values and beliefs manifest themselves through our lifestyle. Our moral values define our culture. 
The importance of culture lies in the close association with the ways we think and we live. Now why am I saying this? Does culture affect perception? Culture determines the structure of our review, which influences our perceptions. American culture is predominantly usual. It encourages children of choice by already very young age to have their own mind. The Japanese culture, for instance, promotes collectivism. So they encourage the parents and the elders to be involved in the raising and the choices of the children. In the same way, the people of the Eastern cultures perceive success as a collective effort, while in the States they claim it's an individual action. A self-made a self-made billionaire, a self-made whatever you are made. So culture frames uh, the, is actually the framework for our thought and behavior. Okay, so we are having established something that the culture we decide to live in and that we promote also determines and dictates how we act. Let's check this out. The question was posed to Jesua Hamasia and his answer was Beelzebub, the prince of all devils and the source of every thin sin. He is death. For I tell you truly evils and dangers untold lie in wait for the son of man. Beelzebub in Christian circles is the prince of all devils and he is the source of every sin which lies in wait in the body of all sons of men. He is death, the Lord of every plague, and taking upon him a pleasing raiment. He tempts and entices the son of man. That means us, the people, riches. He promises you whatever, power, splendid palaces, garments of gold and silver, and a multitude of servants. All these promises he makes you. Just fornication, lustfulness, gluttony, wine-bibbing, righteous living and slothfulness in idle days. And he entices everyone by that which their heart is most inclined. In other words, it lives within us. And in the day that the sons of man have become the slaves of all these vanities and atrocities, then, then, in payment therefore, he snatches from the sons of men all those things the earthly mother have given him in abundance. Now to translate that, remember, we're talking about books that were discovered in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So they have been laying dormant and now they are available. Now as they are available to us, my question is, why did society not listen to Martin Luther on October the 3rd, 1517? Over 500 years have gone by Martin Luther, a priest, warned the Pope about the church abuse which led to the Reformation. Many see this action as the start of Protestantism. In other words, the Protestant church was formed. But wealthy people could pay off their debts or for God forgiveness by paying. Yet nobody dared to go back to the beginning of Christianity in 235 AD. Because what are we looking at? Folks, do you realize what I'm asking you? How come that we are dealing with pandemics, plagues and disasters? Not too many people dare to connect the two. Because it is awkward that I am responsible for the decisions I made. If I want to follow the Lord, the Lord says there are a few things that you need to know. And what are those things? And that is the big question.
I understand that uh, many people believe that we know very little about the early Christianity, for they think it is all a Roman Catholic church. Not accurate. Early Christian literature gives a clear picture of what the beginning of Christianity was like. Foreign political leaders talked about Christianity and Christians in 134 BC. That was 134 years before Jesus was even born. That stands for BC before Christ. Now how in the world did they keep the leadership, keep this quiet from the people that are today dealing with the sacrifices they brought? Folks, I am talking about the United States because this is the perfect example of the body of Christ picking a leader called Trump who lies, cheats and everything. So the question here is what do we have to do with the Roman Empire and what is the connection? How could we fill the accounts of Yeshua HaMashiach also known as Jesus in 30 AD? For I tell you truly, evils and untold dangers lie in wait for the sons of men. We are the sons of men. Beelzebub, the devil, the prince of all devils, and he is the source of all sin, lies in wait for the body of the sons of men. He is death, the lord of every plague, and taken upon him an acceptable attire, he tempts and entices everyone. We are called the son of men. Riches, whatever he promises, power, whatever you want to go for, he says you can get it. But the Lord gave us abundance in health. Why are we sick? He takes from them their breath, that is Beelzebub, the devil. He takes the bone, their flesh, their bowels, their eyes and their ears. And the breath of the Son of Man becomes short and stifled, full of pain. Folks, this was explained around 30 AD. That is almost two, that is two, over 2,000 years ago. Just about 2,000 years ago. He says, and his bones become stiff and knotted. It melts away within and breaks asunder as a stone falling upon a rock, and this flesh waxes fat and watery, it rots and putrefies with scabs and boils that are a disgrace. Folks, Yeshua talked about these things. Satan would do this, and he said, for no man can serve two masters, for either he serves Beelzebub and his devils, or else he does serve God. Either he serves death, or he serves life. Matthew 6, 24. In the complete Jewish Bible it says, No one can be a slave to two masters, for he will either hate the first and love the second, or scorn the second and be loyal to the first. You cannot be a slave to both God and Mammon. And Mammon meaning Beelzebub, the devil. Folks, this is serious stuff. If you consider yourself a Christian, or your life is based on Christianity, whatever line you are picking, have you ever wondered why we stay away from what Jesua taught? He said, we are prodigal sons. You see, when I discovered I was a prodigal son, I was sitting in prison. Maximum security writing stuff that I did not like to write about. I was forced for seven years or 12 years to defend ourselves. We got six months trial because I dared to say no to Mammon, the ones that control the money. Freemasons, Illuminati guys, I held billions of dollars worth of product. And there was just a package that was worth oodles of money that I was going to share with hundreds of people and they would each have enough money to take care of them and their families and their families. But if you dare to take the money away from Beelzebub and his people, you will get a fight. And now sitting in prison, I'm sitting there wondering how in the world and I learned the most important lesson in my life. I am not a Christian anymore 
Although I was trained a preacher, I was an evangelist, I worked with youth, I worked all over the place for 12 years, prison ministry, but I came to the conclusion and understanding that I was a prodigal son. Now you understand why I keep on working on the proper foundation, because once you understand that you are a prodigal son, there are a few things you can do. You can repent and say, Father, I was wrong. What do you want me to do? And the Father will say, bless your heart, come. And he will forgive you. But with forgiveness, there is something else. God wrote those laws and he says, somebody is keeping track of all the problems that you caused, all the sin that you did. And guess who is that person? It's Satan. And Jesus said, seek not the law in your scriptures, but the law is life, whereas the scriptures are death. In other words, the word of God has to become a life in your heart. And the law is a living word of a living God, the living prophets. In other words, for living men and women. For I tell you truly, all living things are nearer to God than the scriptures without life. God so made so life that all living things might become close to him and would be everlasting. So for us to restore that relationship, restorative justice, we have to follow the way, the truth and the light. And not man-made laws that tell you whether you come in, that you will enter into heaven or not. Because it's not up to them. It's up to God. And God says, you do not understand the words of life because you are in death. Darkness darkens your eyes and your ears are stopped with deafness. For I tell you, that is Jeshua HaMashiach or Jesus talking. It profits you not at all that you are pouring over dead scriptures. Dead, dead, D-E-A. D-E-A-D, -E scriptures. If your deeds you deny him who has given you the scriptures. In other words, if you do not do what God asks you to do, it has no purpose. That is why we see enablers in the body of Christ choosing for Trump who lies, that steals, that causes strife. Because those are the signs, the signals of a man that does not follow God. I tell you truly, God and his laws are not in that which you do. So if God says they are not in gluttony or wine bibbing, neither in uncontrolled living, nor in envy, nor seeking after riches, nor in disgust of your enemies, for all these things are far from the true God and his angels. Whoa, those are just little things that Mr. Trump envisions that he promotes. And Christianity is standing by. Folks, I realize that we have to make up our mind. Like I started off with a sandwich with Sambal Ulik. I got it as punishment and I enjoyed it. But our punishment that we are facing right now is in the weakness of our body. If we do follow the word of God, we repent like the prodigal son and say, Father, forgive me. And the Father will forgive. But there are some steps that we need to realize. And those steps I will be talking about. See, when I came to the understanding that I was a prodigal son, not a Christian, I was a prodigal son, reading Jesus' explanation, he said in a parable, You are like the prodigal son, who for many years did eat and drink and pass this day in righteousness and riotness. In other words, did whatever you want, extreme indulgence, Wine bibbers, drinking, sexual pleasures, everything. And every week without your father knowledge, you incurred new debts. 
squandered it all in a few days. Now, as the moneylenders came, the father always paid. But then at a certain time, he said, no, now it's over. And for over seven years, the son continued this life. But at last, his father lost patience and stopped paying the moneylenders. And so they came and took him prisoner. Then the moneylenders who were deceived themselves because they felt robbed from the money that they had lent, they said, you will be working and paying off your debt. And so they focused on getting him the worst jobs just to make sure that he is paying off and learning a lesson. And the distressed son started weeping, but I cannot bear so much as seven days to work for you guys. All he had was dry bread. And as he was weeping, the water of the tears, he mixed his bread and he could chew his bread. And after three days, he basically collapsed and his master said, well, if you can't work, what are you going to do? And the son asked, how long are you going to torment me? He said, till the day when the labor of your hands, you pay me off all your debts. And when seven years are passed, then you will be free. And the distressed son was weeping, but I cannot stay much longer on my legs because I'm aching. And so it was close to a point that the sun was breaking down and the Sabbath day came and nobody was supposed to work. And then the son gathered his remnants. That means he took whatever he had and in staggered actually back to the home from his father and said, Daddy, Father, believe me, for this is the last time. Forgive me all my offenses against you. I swear to you, I will never again live righteously. I will never again live that foolish and I will be obedient and everything you say. So that is where the father said, okay. And he took his son and said, let's have a party. Let's have a, a party because this was the time the father had waited for. And he said, my son is found who was lost. Now, who are the sons? The first son that actually got the law of God were the Jewish people. And what do we have now? Now we have the Christian people and we have the Muslim people and we have the Buddhist and we have all kinds of different religions. But the main fight is still who is more important while we all failed. You see, the Jewish people made the same mistake as the Christian people. We don't understand the lesson. To the father, we are all sons. He gave the most important law to his sons, the firstborn, the Jewish people. And when they failed and crucified Yeshua, he gave an opportunity to the people that were the followers of the way, the truth and the life. Not Christians, because Christians are people that were worshipping the gods, the deities from Satan. Uh oh, pagan Christianity. That is what it became in 325. But up for the first 300 years, those were the believers that followed the way, the truth and the light. And so when you follow the way, the truth and the light, your eyes will be open. If you hear this message, if you have been able to listen this far, I hope you can understand what I mean. If you've turned it off, I hope eventually something will shake you up. So when the sun set, I won't live that way anymore. He will follow the way, the truth and the light. He went back to the father, not a religion. He went back to the father and my father, he said, I will obey you. And he said, based on that, God could turn things around. And as he was paying back his father for what he had screwed up, the father said, well done, you good and faithful boy. He was proud of him. And then Jesus turned to the sick people as he was explaining this. He said, I speak to you in parable that you may better understand God's word. Now, we've heard this and so people say, well, well, well. But Jesus explained something in the books, in the Dead Sea Scrolls. The seven years of eating and drinking and righteous living are the sins of the past. Whatever you have done in the past, that is part of it. 
The wicked creditor is Satan. The debts are diseases. Heavy labor is pain. The prodigal son, that is you and me. The payment of the debt is the casting out from the devils and conditions and your body's healing. In other words, this pandemic is brought on by Satan. The bag of silver that he got from his father to pay off the debt, that is the father, the son, the God Almighty. He is the liberating power of the angels and the father is God. The father's possession are earth and heaven. The servants of the father are the angels. So it is better to work in the field of your father with the angels as workers than you being a creditor. <clears throat> so Jesua explained for us, son of man, if we obey the laws of our heavenly father and work with his angels upon this kingdom, then that they should become the debtors of Satan, the Lord of death, of all sins and diseases. So if we listen to God, we will no longer be on the satanic rule. I tell you truly, generous and many are your sins. We have done so many stupid things and it took me years, in essence, actually six decades, 20 years almost in court, learning the law for the last 12 years and many years you have yielded, yielded to the enticing of Satan. Folks, we have done everything under the sun that God said, don't, gluttonous, wine bibbers, uh, whoring. Your past debts have been multiplied and now you have to repay them to Satan. That is what is happening. And like the prodigal son, you have to wait patiently for the seventh day sanctification. For God will sanctify you, will set you free. Would you want to be set free? See, folks, I believed I was a Christian. I had prayed with hundreds of people, if not a couple of thousands of people, to bring them to the Lord. That is what I was taught. But when I realized that Jesua said, you have to follow the way, the truth, and the light. When I started doing that, he loves us. God loves us. And he will always love you. And he said he will pay off in seven days the debt of seven years. Seven is a holy number. Those that owe the sin and diseases of seven years, but pay honestly and persevere till the seventh day. So it is going to be tough, but he shall turn and forgive you. He will forgive you and all the stuff you have done in the past. If we sin for seven years, one of the people asked, is that and time seven years. And Jesus said, he will forgive you because he loves us. How can we get forgiveness? He by fasting and praying, you seek the angels of God and then each day you continue to fast and pray. God's angels will blot out one year of your evil deeds from the book of your body and your spirit. In other words, what is written in our, on our body, our pain and suffering and everything that we have to go through or with this pandemic, we can reverse that by prayer and fasting. And then when the last page is blotted out and cleansed, it will cleanse us from all our sins. This is a whole different story than you hear when you go in church, oh, praise the Lord, just repeat this prayer and now you are saved. Folks, there's a whole lot more. He freezes off the clutches of Satan and suffering. He takes you within his house and commands that all his servants and all his angels will serve you. But as that process continues, we have to get rid of some things. And that is why we have to wear the special clothing from God Almighty so that we are set free. Folks, I'm not sure if you're ready for this, but there is one thing. As we come to understand the beauty and the love of God, He loves us so much. We repent and sin no more. But then in the process, we have to learn to think like Jesua. And as we come to understand, we might recognize that the society we were brought up in 
is not the society you believed in. See, this is not just an opinion. This is something that is ingrained in your, uh, for years. It is a relentless remorse, a lack of remorse actually, because we were taught different. But now we're coming to an understanding that the convictions we had, we were so convinced. Now we are on a crossroad of a conviction versus an opinion. An opinion you can switch, but a conviction you have to seek the presence of the Lord so that your eyes will be open. Now remember, tough times never last. With tough people, they will do. God bless you.